Hello everyone, in this video we will be talking about continuity and the intermediate value theorem. So first let's go ahead and define what it means to be continuous at a point. So f is going to be a function defined on an open interval containing uh, the point we care about c on the x-axis. f is then continuous at x equals c if the limit of the function as x approaches c is f of c, basically if the limit is what you get when you just plug in C. So notice this is really just continuity at a point. And it's probably useful to remember, right, that this is a two-sided limit. So when you're checking these, you should often be thinking, okay, is does this limit exist? And then you probably have to check from the left and the right. So next we'll look at uh, F being continuous on an interval. And so this is pretty simple. It's just if it's continuous for every point in that interval, and lastly, if that interval happens to be negative infinity to infinity, uh, so if f is continuous for any value, we call it a continuous function. And we have seen an example of this. Uh, polynomials are continuous functions. They are continuous everywhere. All right, so for continuity, that definition may not necessarily be clear, and it doesn't necessarily tell us what we're really looking for in a function, right? Like, okay, this is a property, I can just plug this in, but what does it really mean? So a lot of times you'll hear a less precise definition, but it's one that still gets the idea home. And that is, if f, we say f is continuous if you can draw its graph without lifting your pencil. So again, this isn't precise enough, and this isn't the definition that we'll use in class to actually show that something is continuous, but it is a good way to be able to look at a graph and think, okay, is this function continuous or not? And also just what this limit definition means. So I wanna analyze that a bit more in terms of what is the connection between these two things, right? So uh, the first thing I wanna look at would be things called a jump discontinuity. Right, so here it's exactly what it sounds like. So it's discontinuous, not continuous at that point, hence discontinuity, and it's a jump, right? We're, we're jumping up there at C, and uh, what is really going on? So how do we connect this to limits, right? So here we would say that the limit as X approaches C from the left of F of X is not equal to the limit as X approaches C from the right of F of X. And we know that if our two one-sided limits don't agree, this implies that the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not exist. So basically, if the limit didn't exist, then we're not gonna be continuous. Okay, so we definitely want one thing. We want this limit to exist, right? So this is operating under the, it's continuous if you don't have to lift your pencil. We're gonna slowly work our way to getting to the limit of f of x must be f of c. Uh, so we want this to exist. All right, so now we're gonna look at removable discontinuities. Okay, so this is an example of a removable discontinuity, and it takes that name because you can think of just like plucking out that point there where we now have the hole. So this one does satisfy the limit existing, right? We're approaching the same value from each uh, side, but f of c does not exist, right? C is not in the domain. And that's a problem because how are you gonna pick up, or yeah, how are you not going to pick up your pencil if you have to like jump over this one little hole, right? It's not really possible. So the second thing we want is we definitely want f of c to exist or c to be in the domain, okay? Um, all right, so I'll go ahead and draw that in. So what if I just uh, put f of c up here? Well, that's still a problem, right? So not only do we want f of c to exist, it needs to be in the right spot, right? We want to move this down and really fill in that hole. And so our like third condition here is that we not only want f of c to exist, but we want f of c to be equal to the thing that you're approaching. And that is exactly the definition that we came up with at the start, right? So this is kind of breaking down why that definition kind of reflects what we think of when we hear draw a graph where you don't have to pick up your pencil. So one thing I should mention briefly would be continuity at endpoints. We've really talked about open intervals because, right, if you see limit as x approaches c of f of x, 
is f of c, we've been saying, hey, we should look at the left limit and the right limit. Well, what if you don't have a left limit or you don't have a right limit, right? So for the square root of x minus one here, right, if you have like a left endpoint, we would say this is continuous at one since the limit as x approaches one from the right of f of x uh, equals f of one. And similarly over here, right, you have like a right endpoint and we have that the limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x uh, equals f of five in this case, right? This is at five and this guy is at one. Um, so basically if the one side that is there works, then it's considered continuous at their endpoints. All right, so now we're gonna talk about continuity of piecewise functions. So we've seen a lot of nice functions thus far, right? So we've, we've talked about the fact that logarithms, exponentials, trig, polynomials, rational functions, all of these are continuous on their domains. And basically sums, differences, uh, products, etc. those are all gonna be continuous as well. But what if we try to piece them together? Things can go wrong at the breakpoints, right? So like at three here. So there we'd have to do a little more investigation. So in this case, you know, we're given a line and a parabola as kind of our two parts. And we really have the choice of our y-intercept here with our line to make this continuous. So the way you should picture this, right? So this is x squared minus three, uh, but it's only from x greater than or equal to three. So it's like up here. Um, and then we've got to find, right, which line is going to make this happen, where they actually join together, right? So we've got to find the right k that is going to cross the y-axis to make this happen. So to do that, I mean, we've got to go back to the definition. So we've got to look at the limit. So, right, we want this to be equal to f of 3 to be continuous, and f of 3 here is, you plug it into x squared minus 3, and we get 6. Okay, well... If I'm going to talk about a two-sided limit, I better go back and see that my one-sided limits are equal to one another. So first, let's look at the limit from the left. So here I'd be plugging in values less than 3. So this is going to be x plus k that we're plugging into. And that's a line that's continuous, nice to plug into, so I literally can just replace that. So that's 3 plus k. And then from the right, I'm using x squared minus 3. And that's the one we've already computed. That's going to be 6 at 3, right? We just plug that in. So for our limit to exist and be equal to 6, we've got to have 3 plus k equal 6. And therefore, we only have one choice of k. k has to be 3 to make this continuous. So for your first exercise, I want you to find k such that this piecewise function is continuous at 2. So the last topic on this video is going to be the intermediate value theorem. So this is one of the big reasons why we like continuity. So here, uh, f is going to be a continuous function on a closed interval. So these are kind of the two hypotheses that have to be satisfied. And so for us, we're going to assume without loss of generality that f of a is less than f of b. Basically, if it was the other way around, it would also work. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, then for any value between f of a and f of b, there's going to be one value, c, on the open interval such that f of c is y. So this is a lot of words. What's really going on? Let's draw a picture. So um, we've got an interval from a to b. Draw some continuous function. So the point here... Uh, we said without loss of generality, f of a is less than f of b. That just means that I'm climbing, right? So my f of a is down here, and my f of b is up here. If I drew it as, you know, the other way around, it, it wouldn't really matter or change what's going on. The point is, right, for any value in between here, hence intermediate values, right, for any of these guys, there's going to be a corresponding C, so let's go ahead and pick one of these. So Y, and then we're going to go over and see, okay, where does this graph hit Y? It's here. That's going to be my C. 
right? So the point here is that for any value in between f of a and f of b, we have some point, in this case, this c, such that f of c is y. So what is this really saying? Well, it's basically saying if you can't pick up your pencil, how are you going to travel from down here to up here without crossing all of the values in between, right? Um, now, you may not go directly there. You might go up, go above and back down, right? There might be multiple values for some y, right? You could have y and like this could be your c1 and this could be your c2, for instance. But the point is you have to cross them. To, to not cross a y would mean you'd have to jump. And if you jump, you're not continuous. So that's basically what this is saying. Okay, so why do we care about the IVT, which is how we'll usually uh, refer to the intermediate value theorem so as to not have to say that every time. Uh, so we actually have some real world implications. So temperature, for instance, is something that is continuous, right? You're not usually seeing the temperature fluctuating wildly. Um, so if you assume it's a continuous function, then if you wake up and it's 66 degrees, you head to your first class, it's warmed up to 75 degrees, then the IVT says uh, during that time between waking up and going to your first class, every temperature between 66 and 75 degrees is hit. Right, so at some point, you know, if your first class is at 10 a.m. and you wake up at 7, then at some point in those three hours, it had to have been 72 degrees. Um, you know, you could also apply this to velocities, right? If you're traveling, you start at zero miles an hour, you top out at 85 on your drive, you had to literally go every single speed between zero and 85 during that trip, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, maybe a more mathematical application would be finding roots of functions, right? So finding when a function is zero. So an example would be f of x equals x minus cosine x. So what are we looking for? Why does this help us? Well, first of all, this is continuous because it's made up of two continuous functions. Sums, products, quotients of continuous functions are all going to be continuous, as long as you're not like dividing by zero. Um, so this is continuous. So what are we looking for? Why, how can we guarantee that a value is zero? Well, if you have f of a less than zero and f of b greater than zero, then right you have something down here, you have something up here, and you're continuous, then if you're going to get up there, you had to cross the x-axis somewhere, right? There has to be some c such that f of c is zero. So what we look for is, okay, let's find a value that makes our function negative. Let's find a value that makes it positive. Somewhere in between, it has to have a root. So here, just kind of an easy one because cosine of zero is easy. Right, that's one, then f of zero is negative one, that's less than zero. And then you can pick, I don't know, whatever you wanna pick. Um, I think pi is a fine one. So pi, you're gonna get pi minus negative one, and that's pi plus one, which is most definitely greater than zero, it's bigger than four. So, x minus cosine x has a root somewhere in the interval from zero to pi by the intermediate value theorem. And if you keep doing that, right, so if you check the midway point there and see what the signs are, you can tell whether it's in the first half of that interval or the second half of that interval and kind of keep doing if you want to zone in on exactly where it is. So for your second exercise, this is going to be kind of an open-ended one. Uh, so you're not necessarily going to be graded on correctness or anything. I'm just kind of curious what you think here and how you interpret the IVT. So we're going to let f be a continuous function on the closed interval from negative 2 to 2. I give you the values 0 and 10 at the endpoints. Does there exist a value c in the open interval here such that f of c is 12?
So let me know what you think. All right. Thank you for watching.